thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't see all of you on one screen at the same time because there are so many of you, but Mark and I have been looking forward to spending some time with you. Uh, Mark, how are you? Can you share the screen now? I will. I'm going to start sharing. I, I just want to express my appreciation to America and Leap Montessori for the opportunity to share this with you. I see a number of people uh, whose names have gone by Yes. That are uh, that have heard this before. They they were they were in a previous session. So, uh, P, I, I, not not to single people out, but Peter, Kathy, Jean, you, you guys are you're going to be able to do this by the time we're done. <laughs> you better do this talk. But I, I'll start sharing the screen. Uh, we're going to run through a slide deck, which um, you are welcome to. Merka has these slides, and Merka, please feel free to distribute them to. Uh, people, if, if you'd like, uh, afterward. And we're going to uh, amplify on some of the things on the slides as we go along, but uh, there's a lot we could say. So if, if, you, if you have questions, please jot them down as we go along. And if we don't get to all your questions today, feel free to email us. And our email is in the slide deck, uh, as you'll see, and we're, we're happy to go back and forth with you that way. Now, let me see if I can get the screen share. Uh, it should be sharing. Yes. Great. So you can, uh, we'll look at the chat function. So if you have questions as we go along, you can certainly uh, put them in chat and we'll uh, be mindful of those and certainly try and respond to those. But also at the end, when we're finished talking, um, then it will be your time and we'll throw it open to you. So here's Perfect. our contact well, information. And, uh, and you'll have that when you get the slides. Uh, but to launch into this, we, we really want to begin uh, with with a quote, and it's the it's the quote that that really inspired us to put this whole series together. And it was in an article from the McKinsey Consulting Group um, in the United States last spring. It said, "Stop assuming that the old ways, circa January 2020, will come back. Those days are gone. And if anything, uh, the the sort of flow of events in the world since since May has only intensified this. Um, there was a day last January when we all came out of the mid holidays, uh, mid-year holidays, we went to school, we thought uh, we knew what was going to happen in the January to June interval, and uh, then by the end of March, 1.6 billion school children around the world were out of school uh, and learning remotely and uh, pretty much everything had been turned upside down. So what's to follow really are 10 things that we think school leaders and all of our clients all around the world are private independent schools of one form or another. And school leaders and their governing boards need to be thinking about as they uh, imagine what a future might look like. So the, the first trend that we want to focus on is a simple concept, but one that's going to have profound implications for our schools. And that's that the COVID-19 emergency has a very, very long tail. And by long tail, we mean the effects are gonna be felt months, years, perhaps even decades down the road. Uh, if one looks back, say, to World War I as an example of an event with a long tail, and one can trace forward the uh, Treaty of Versailles, which uh, theoretically ended that war, and see the seeds of conflict in the Middle East today, in Southeast Asia, and, and all over the world. Uh, that's a, what we mean by a long tail, is that events in the moment will continue to affect the world for a long time to come. And that's going to be true of how COVID-19 affects schools not just in the coming year, but in the years to follow. And that notion about factoring that into our strategy really becomes critical to our thinking about the future of schools. This is not a uh, technical problem that resolves itself in a matter of weeks and then goes away. It's something which is gonna last a very, very long time. So with that notion in mind, we can, we can move to the second trend, which is that uh, the anti-globalization riptide 
gathers strength. I'm, I'm not sure how Riptide translates in all the languages of, of people that are on this this call. And it's it's really amazing to see uh, how many different languages are represented by the names uh, and faces that we saw as you joined. But, uh, where, regardless of wherever you are in the world, your life has been profoundly affected by globalization in the past 30 years. Uh, Tom Friedman's famous book, The World is Flat, uh, comes to mind. But uh, there, underneath all of that was an uh, anti-globalization riptide uh, reflected in uh, conservative politics in the United States, the uh, European Union, China, and elsewhere. Uh, COVID-19 has given new legs, new energy to the anti-globalization riptide. And that's gonna have an effect on expat flows around the world for schools that are dependent upon expat, on uh, language preferences, uh, and uh, even on the kind of education that um, students or families are interested in their children receiving in different parts of the world. So when you think about a future, the once uh, inexorable march of globalization now has to factor in the potential that at least for quite a long time, that will back up. And uh, what seemed to be a seamless world will become ever less seamless. Uh, an example of this is the, the latest forecasts uh, for uh, any sort of recovery in the international aviation world, airlines, now putting it off to 25 and 26 and beyond in terms of when we might begin to see international flights resuming in anywhere near the volume it was before. So all of those forces which had really remade our world over the past 30 years uh, and that most of us on this call had benefited by now seem to be very much, well, up in the air. The third trend that we wanna talk about is re about remote learning. Clearly, all of you had figured out when your schools closed down, when your countries or your regions closed down, how to deliver curriculum in the best possible way on screen. Um, and I'm really um, amazed and uh, with great respect that Montessorians have figured out how to translate something that is so fundamentally high touch in person relationship build, built, um, community built to the screen and to engagement with children wherever they are. But this trend actually talks about the idea that we have always thought about hiring our faculty members, our, our teachers, our guides um, for their Montessori background, their training, their interest in Montessori, their ability to deliver curriculum. And now we have to think about something else, which is ability to, to deliver curriculum in multiple streams using multiple ways to talk with and engage with kids. So this is certainly uh, not just a short-term concept. This school year, we think we know, is gonna be a school year of pivots after pivots. So in-person, um, virtual, in-person, virtual. We don't know um, the length of time that those uh, different ways of teaching and learning will actually um, last in some locations, in some countries, in some regions, it will be um, look very different than we expect it's gonna to look domestically in the United States, for example. But we do know that as you think about uh, skills and talents and that ability to reach children and to engage them uh, and, and to deliver what is the fundamental Montessori mission of, in the world, um, we need to look for another skill set beyond those that we've already thought about. And the fourth trend is about agility, which is related to um, the idea of delivery of curriculum and multiple channels. Uh, we really are being forced to become agile in ways that we hadn't anticipated, we sometimes aren't comfortable with. Um, we are also in terms of courage and bravery and leadership, thinking about how to, um, how to make decisions 
that are very agile, um, not locked in. Um, we head down a pathway and with the idea, the knowledge that we may have to change direction at any moment. Uh, and so agility really in our, in our families, in our students, in our faculty and in our leadership um, and with our boards, all of this is fundamental and, and underpinning to everything that we're now doing and trying to engage in. In higher education, colleges and universities, we're starting to see the term pedagogical resiliency surface. And, and it's the notion not of just being able to pivot to go remote if one needs to, but doing design of courses intentionally so that they can simultaneously be multi-channel. They can be delivered in person, remotely, or in a hybrid of those two such that a pivot really isn't necessary. If it's necessary in a week or a month not to meet in person, you're already there. You're already in that channel. I don't quite know how that translates um, to lower L, but uh, it, it, it is something I think we have to begin thinking about is how do we not just hire for this, but how do we make our entire school ready for shifts of the kind that we've gone through in the last year. And to, to, to be fair, that's not something that anyone went to teacher training institutes to learn yeah. how to do. Yeah. So it's something that we're going to have to figure out and bring people along with well after they were trained as Montessorians. I, I, I would add one more thing, which is the idea that we entered spring thinking that it was temporary. We entered spring thinking that it was only going to be a few weeks and then it became longer than a few weeks and then it became for many of us the whole rest of the academic year and sometimes it was the government who said that's it sometimes it was local authorities who said that's it sometimes it was you as leaders in the school community that said we we can't see a way to come come back together physically and we're going to continue to do what we're doing right now i think there was a yearning and a hope uh, that over the summer things would get better and we might be able to go back um, back to the way things were uh, I think part of the message that Mark and I are wanting to deliver is we're not going back. We're going forward. And what forward looks like may have some connection to what used to be, but what forward looks like really is going to, going to continue to evolve and change. And so we want to have you leading conversations in your community about what forward looks like, because there are still a lot of us out there in the world who are trying to figure out how do we wiggle our way back to January 2020? How do we get back to what things were like then? And our belief is it's never going back to exactly what it was. Mark? I'm trying to advance. Um, sometimes buttons don't work the way they're supposed to on computers. <laughs> the, the fifth trend is one that, that we think is particularly important, uh, particularly for our private independent school uh, clients. And that's the notion that the future uh, may, may well be smaller. And many Montessori schools are small by design and, and intent. Um, but th this is something I think we ought to take into, take into account that as the economic impact, particularly of those of us who uh, charge tuition, uh, as opposed to those who receive public funding for schools, and the future may well be smaller. There, there may be fewer customers, if, if I could use that word, for our product and the right size of our school may not be uh, what it has been in the past. And, and that's a hard thing for leaders and particularly hard for governing boards to accept. They're used to measuring in some ways the school by growth. Are we meeting our enrollment targets? Are we meeting our net tuition revenue targets? And uh, what we're saying here is that the, the conversation in your administrative team with your business manager at the board finance committee needs to be about what's the right size of school to match the revenue we need in order to operate and how do we get there in an intentional way with a plan rather than in an accidental way as a response to uh, a, a revenue shortfall that that uh, we just came upon. So this notion of the future may well be smaller calls for us to rethink, and we're going to come back to this theme in our guidance to you at the end about three things to do now. 
uh, to rethink what uh, what the right size of school looks like and what the right scale of things are for you. The next trend is something that we've thought a lot about and we've been talking about with a number of um, boards and uh, heads uh, in, in the US, which is about bravery uh, or another way to think about it is courage. That being a leader in this time is fundamentally a description of being brave, being bold, being thoughtful, um, being willing to stand out and to um, make decisions and to move communities together and forward in ways that are not popular, um, but are really all about the best interest of the child, all about serving Montessori's mission, all about serving the mission of your school and your community. So bravery looks very different in, in different ways, on different days, in different locations. But what we want you to think about is that this is, leading has never been a, a popularity contest. Leading has never been a situation where all members of your community at any given moment are um, in agreement that a decision that you've made is exactly the decision that they wanted you to make. But more than ever now, in this moment in time, we see that sense that making a smart decision, using data, using uh, science, using the information that your governments are sharing with you, and, and making a decision in the best interest of the children in your community, and the, the teachers, the guides, the, the families in your community, is so difficult because those may be in conflict with each other. What parents in the community may want may not be in the best interest of the faculty, um, your teachers in, in your community, or may not be in the best interest of the way in which you see um, delivering program for your children. And so courage and bravery and boldness uh, and willingness to move your community forward, sometimes dragging some people along with you is going to be key, ever more important. So just a, a remark to our um, folks from the United States uh, that are on, on the line, and for some of the rest of you, there's probably a version of this that's, that's applicable. Uh, this fall brings an incredibly intense emotional stew into our schools. The, the trifecta of the pandemic still in process, the um, national reckoning with uh, race relations and systemic racism in the United States, and uh, a highly divisive and polarized presidential election, which will play out in our school communities. Uh, it's it, never going to be easy to be a school leader. This fall, at least in North America, it's gonna take an incredible amount of courage to be able to stand firm and navigate your way through. There may be versions of that that look somewhere the same across the world, but mm -hmm. we think it's particularly gonna be intense in the US. Mm -hmm. Mark? Time and space have become fluid as we have um, gone into the, the, this pandemic. Uh, we've joked that uh, weekends have lost their meaning, that uh, day merges with evening, that uh, work and school have merged with home. We're, we're all, we've seen, uh, you probably saw the video last spring of BBC man uh, doing a, a, it was a BBC commentator from Korea, uh, doing a telecast from his home and the door op cracks open behind him and a toddler come, crawls in on the floor and then another child comes in to get the toddler and then the, his partner comes in behind that to get both children. We, we're, we've all seen that, but we've all lived that now, haven't we? We've all lived mm -hmm. dogs, cats, significant others uh, peering over our shoulder into cameras. Offices and classrooms have, have merged with kitchens and porches what this has done is it's taught us something. <clears throat> it's taught us we don't all need to be in the same place. It's taught us at Triangle Associates that we, we used to think that we needed a brick and mortar office uh, in, in St. Louis where we're based uh, so that our, our back office could function. We don't need that anymore. We were able to function completely seamlessly from, from wherever we are. And, and that's the, the beauty of, of technology. But it also begins to transform two other things, how families experience the world 
and the need for families to be able to restore some modicum of balance to their lives. Right. And it begins to affect what people expect of school. So the school day begins to finally break down and lose meaning as something that happens between oh, 08 in the morning and uh, 3 p.m. in a classroom in a particular building. And it becomes something that can happen everywhere. Or as one school head said, he needed to come to terms with the idea that all his students needed was an on-ramp to be able to access the program from wherever they were. And that that on-ramp could be virtual or it could be something else. But uh, increasingly, that fluidity, which is something which we've talked about, and in many cases, I've heard school leaders fantasize about breaking down the school calendar in the school year, now is possible in ways that we really hadn't seen demonstrated before. So there's blessings to this, and there's downsides to this. The downside is that any sort of semblance of school, home, work, life balance evaporates in this fluidity. Yeah, and I, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about that because to all of you as leaders of a community, um, what we are seeing is incredibly important is, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this again at the end, is the idea that um, because time and space are fluid, um, boundaries are broken. And some of those boundaries breaking are actually positive, as Mark said, but some of the boundaries breaking down are not positive. And so we've seen people in this um, spring and into the summer um, talking with us about the level of personal stress that they feel, um, the amount of hours that they're working that are much longer and much more involved than the hours that they would have worked had there been a uh, structured school day, if you will, and then a structured summer break. Um, so we want to say to all of you, and we'll come back to this, I think, at the end, that finding a way to set boundaries so that work is work and home is home and helping families to do the same thing, to set times for learning and times for not, um, especially when you have parents, if you're, if you're, if you're remote, um, if you're doing virtual uh, learning at some point, um, and you have a lot of family, uh, families who are trying to work at the same time, they're also trying to help their child uh, learn, that you help them find ways to structure life so that it isn't so um, overlapping that people are um, throwing up their hands and saying, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to let my kids watch television, or I'm just going to let my kids be on devices. So the, one of the downsides to this is that everything has seeped across these boundaries and barriers. And it's really important for all of us, for our mental health, our well-being, and our ability to actually learn um, to set parameters and help your families to be able to do that too. Which what we're really nosing around here is the concept that um, on, the, on the upside, that school centricity is, is over. Uh, the idea that school is limited to a particular place and time now becomes very different. Uh, years ago, Sal Khan, whom many of you know from the Khan Academy online platform, used to news about what it would take, what it would mean if we stopped holding time constant and letting mastery vary in school and if we held mastery constant and let time vary. And that possibility exists, that, uh, that time can now be much more fungible, much more tradable for different, different things. And families and students, as Judy is saying, need to be able to make smart allocations of time. The implication of that for us as school leaders, though, is that the concept that the brick and mortar building we're in may come to mean less particularly for older students than it's meant in the past. And with that notion, uh, we've, we've seen a, a parents have, for better or worse, had an over their kid's shoulder visibility into what's going on in classrooms now as they have, have, have often not liked what they have seen in the quality of teaching, uh, particularly uh, in, in schools in the United States. But that visibility lets the parents believe that school too could happen a bit differently. So though they want their kids back in school, 
they're going to want some of those pieces of school centricity to give way to community as classroom, to home as classroom, to other places as classroom. Mark, I would also add, oh, please. You know, to build on something that you said a few minutes ago, that um, that because the classroom, the literal um, classroom, is no longer necessarily physically in one place, um, it also allows for any of you who have programs that go past upper L to be thinking about what we know about adolescents and adolescents' need for sleep, um, adolescents' brains. You know, is there a way to change the start time and stop time of the teaching day to actually allow um, that we're now going to be in, in better service of the need of uh, adolescents to get more sleep and that, you know, can we, can we change the hours of our, of our learning day? So there's a lot of positives that could potentially come mm -hmm. from this, but it really means um, thoughtful conversations with your uh, teaching staff and with your boards, um, as well as with the parents in your community about how it is that you're gonna create that time framework in teaching and learning. I'm just thinking, Judy, that there are probably some teachers that are, that are themselves um, behaving like older adolescents and would right. like to have that same. Well, we all know that we have we have different preferences in terms of getting up early or staying up That's late. True. So um, That's true. Yeah. The, the ninth trend is uh, is is a fundamental question about um, what you've seen so far that you'd like to keep. And that's a hard thought for people to ponder at this stage because there's so much that people would like to uh, put behind them in the rush to get back to January 2020. But uh, we've not found an administrative team yet that has not been able to answer this question with at least several things that they've seen in their school since the pandemic began that they would like to see continue. Whether it's greater levels of collaboration among teachers, uh, higher engagement with parents uh, in helping their kids learn, whether they're seeing kids taking more responsibility for their own uh, education, a variety of things that we've seen described as posits, goods, good things that have happened since the pandemic began that you'd like to see continue as, and I, I hesitate to even use this term, especially when you see our next slide, uh, as some sort of next normal begins to emerge. So that's a great topic. Before it gets too far on from last spring and the summer, to, to try to recollect with your faculty and your, uh, your administrators at school, what are we seeing that we really don't want to lose as we get back into classrooms, as, as the school life begins to look more like the rhythm that we used to know is normal. And the answers to that can be illuminating. It may take people a little while to come up with them, so give them some time to do that. But we, we found that to be quite a, 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 a positive question to ask because it gets people thinking about the ways in which they've adapted to this world in constructive and positive ways. Yeah, the, we have heard a lot in the spring uh, about what we've lost, um, mm -hmm. the grief connected to all the, all the things that we lost when schools shut down, uh, and they're mighty. Um, we could all make a very lengthy list of the things that we've lost in our personal lives and in our professional lives and our family lives, um, you know, but one of the things that, that we also began to hear slowly uh, is what Mark just talked about, which is there are things that when people started to look at said, well, but this is actually interesting or the conversations we're having, we wouldn't have had in the same way this year or innovations that we have put in place because they are in best service of the, the, the teachers and the um, guides and the students in our community, we were never, we, we weren't even thinking about getting to this. Um, we probably wouldn't have tried that experiment. And even though some of the experiments that all of you tried may not have succeeded, what you did is you boldly went out there, you were courageous in your leadership, you tried them, and I'm sure that you also have had conversations about why, it, why didn't it work and what of this are we gonna keep and how are we gonna do this better the next time. So I think that all of this idea of taking with us the goods that came out of this is really important. And if you haven't had a chance to talk to your community about the goods, um, think about how you might do that. And really, truly think about asking your board to have this conversation. 
because they, they may well be feeling kind of battered um, by all of the other conversations you've had to have with them about decisions and about finances and about enrollment numbers and about, um, for some of you, depending on where you're located, whether or not your teaching faculty is even going to be geographically located in the same place that you are. Um, and who's not coming back and who maybe you haven't been able to have come back. So there's a lot of, you know, um, tough stuff that has been talked about. So reframing the conversation into what good has happened and how do we want to build on that is a good turn. Mark? Mark referenced this, and this is the last trend we want to talk to you about, and then we have a few ideas to share with you. Uh, the next normal, <laughs> whatever the next next thing is, um, which we may or may not call normal, isn't going to be what we have defined as normal, nor is it going to be the thing that we stick with. Um, that's the idea of the long tail here. Where we get to is where we get to. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be locked down and hammered in, and this is now how it's going to be forever. What it means is it's where we are right now. And I think that that the anxiety that people have, have been feeling, the wish to get clarity, the wish for certainty, the wish to know, um, is driving a lot of the angst that you're probably already hearing from your, your teaching um, faculty, uh, from your staff, from your parents and your community, um, even angst that you're feeling, anxiety that you're feeling, because you'd like to be certain. Um, one of the heads that I spoke with recently, uh, just the, it happened that the day that um, we were on a call, uh, he said, I have decided how we're going to open school. Now, he's in the northeast of the U.S. I've decided how we're going to open school. I decided it last night, and then I, now, mind you, this was the first, second week in August, um, and school is due to open in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, he's, what he said is, I now talked with my administrative team, and one of the people on the administrative team said to me, but that's not what we told people in July. Uh, and he said, right, um, it's not what we told people in July. And I think it's that idea that we want to create something that is normal, um, whatever we define as that, and then we want to be able to stick to it. And what we want you to know and what we want your community to begin to actually think about is that where we are is where we are. And that the decisions that we're making are always about the best interest of the children and always about the best interest of our faculty and staff. So we have a couple of things that we want to share with you that we'd like for you to think about doing now. And then we're going to open this up to all of you. And, and there, we could go on and on about things to do now. The, these are three things that we thought were well within uh, the, the sphere of control of school leaders. Uh, and uh, you can think about it as, the, as levers that you can actually pull and work. Uh, put together, they, they are things which all are about reestablishing the kind of school, community, and environment that, um, that you want to have. And not that you necessarily used to have. We, we want to begin with preparing your board. If you have a governing board, this is the time to hold them incredibly close. Um, that's that's a, a paramount importance for school leaders uh, who, who do work with boards, and we're aware that not all of you have boards, but many of you do. The alignment between school heads, uh, directors, and, uh, and the governing board needs to be absolutely tight at this point, because your board is going to be hearing from the community about decisions that you make, and they need to, um, the term in English would be have your back, be able to defend those decisions in public when there's blowback against them in the community. And you need to know what the intent of your board is and, and the policy that they wish that be implemented in the school as well. So preparing the board is really all about getting board and administration on the same page. And, and it starts in our view with that very first slide of January 2020 not returning. They need to accept that. Mm -hmm. And then to realize that how school looks in the future may be subtly and dramatically 
different than how it's looked in the past. The size of school may be different than in the past. The way in which program is delivered may be different than in the past. But beginning those conversations, predicting them as you go into the school year, sets the stage for there to be uh, fewer, there will be surprises, but fewer surprises as you get into the year. And one more thing I would add to what Mark said is that, um, like it or not, we probably are going to have families that are going to revolve in and revolve out of our communities. And the board has to be prepared for that because that's not been normative, except if, you, if a number of families in your community are actually expats. And um, in that case, you're sometimes accustomed to having a, a multinational corporation shut down and move their, their people, and then it changes your enrollment. Um, but normally we had a, have a sort of predictable um, admission cycle, relatively speaking. And it's very frightening for boards to, to realize that you're starting the year maybe with a different number lower than you had expected or that you have families who are going to start with you and then they're going to decide that maybe they can't continue with you and then they're going to come back again with you. And so I think just, again, as Mark said, predicting the possibility that some of this might happen and helping the board to just breathe into it and have a conversation about it will make life easier for you as leaders in the community. And, okay. and if they know that your eye is on that ball, right. then, uh, then they don't have to. So the second idea that we wanted to think about, um, have you think about is this idea that of ministering to your community. Uh, we know that you have been doing this over the spring and probably over the summer. But we think that this is part of the long tail, that you are going to have a community, a set of uh, members of your community who are going to need more from you than they've ever needed. They're going to need surety. They're going to need um, uh, to see your sense of confidence about leading. They're going to need a place to talk about how frightened they are sometimes, about how angry they are that things aren't the way they want them to be, about how confused they are about how to help their kids learn. Um, about how stressed they feel about trying to juggle things. And so to start, to start your academic year, just thinking about the idea of checking in on some kind of regular basis with all of the different members of your community. Some people will want to spend more time doing this with you. Others will not. But I think if you have some kind of regular meetings scheduled for uh, parents to just share with you their frustrations, for um, older students to be able to talk about what they're experiencing in, um, in the learning environment and where it's gotten difficult for them, for your faculty, of course, to be talking with you. Um, but not about how to teach this better, but about how do they feel. How are they doing? What do they need from each other to help them support doing their best work? So that idea of ministering and taking care of those emotional needs that people in your community have in a very deliberate sort of way. You know, Judy, I, I've always thought that there was a, an element of um, a school headship that was pastoral care. Absolutely. Um, and uh, not in a religious sense, but uh, in, in a secular sense. Uh, and this is what we're really talking about here is, is the need for you to, as leaders, to, to embrace that aspect of the role and to see it as being necessary because it becomes not just good for people, but it becomes part of the glue that holds your school community together. When, when not only are you meeting educational needs, but you're helping meet the incredibly acute emotional needs that families and students have right now. And our third idea is one that we think is um, probably going to be ongoing, but it's, it's having conversations with your leadership team if you have an um, intact leadership team, and certainly with your board if you have a board, about how you redefine outcomes and expectations for this year. Um, what, what should parents be looking for? Um, what should you be looking for from your faculty, from your teaching uh, staff? What should they be looking for from each other? Um, there are going to be some uh, teachers who are exceedingly um, self-critical and uh, thinking that they should be performing at a much higher level than they um, feel like they're capable of doing in this very... Um, fluctuating environment. There are others who 
uh, don't understand what it is to be able to really deliver uh, curriculum in some way that's different than having your students in front of them in a bricks and mortar classroom. So the more you can redefine this um, and make it yours, make it a definition of your particular school in your particular community so that your parents understand what to look for. Um, we think the, the whole year will be better for you. And that, that extends to uh, a question which uh, t teachers are already asking, which is uh, I, uh, what's expected of me now? Uh, what what do I need to be doing in order to be a good teacher in this school today? And the reality is it's looking different. So helping them add definition to that to the extent that you can uh, is something that helps everyone in the school know uh, how to measure themselves, as Judy said. But it also sets the stage for more realistic expectations on the parts of families and others. Well, those are our musings about uh, the, the shape of things to come. Um, obviously, the things to come are uh, still being formed, and uh, what eventual shape they'll take is a work in progress. But that piece is, is, is what we know, is that as the long tail of COVID-19 plays out, uh, our schools will be transformed as a result. They won't be the same that they were before. Uh, the question for you, your team, your boards to be thinking about is, if we don't go back to January 2020, what is it going to take for us to emerge a stronger school? What would that look like? A better, stronger version of ourselves, given all the emerging realities that question alone is going to be worth a year of contemplation as you get into the school year ahead. But at this point, uh, Mirko, we'll, we'll put this back to you, and we'd like to open it to discussion uh, with each other, uh, questions with us, and uh, we just are so appreciative of you listening to us for the past 45 minutes.